As a child, I was always looking for adventure and played outside for hours. Sometimes I would pick wildflowers that I would find along the side of the road home to enjoy a piece of nature at home. Unfortunately, by the time I would get home, the wildflower was already wilting in my hands. Only later did I learn that the puppy feels most at home where the ground has been disturbed and that it cannot be picked. By now, you might all be wondering, why is she talking about puppies, when clearly this TED Talk is about graffiti and street art? Well, in recent years, I had to watch with concern how more and more artworks are being placed in a so-called vase. Not just to show off, but for the money. Both the artworks and the puppy will be destroyed if you love them too much. Let me explain. In the US, a big shift started in cities like New York around the 50s and 60s. Most white and middle class communities started to move to the suburbs of the city. Because of this, communities that couldn't move were left to deal with difficulties. In response, the younger generation started an underground movement. Graffiti became a powerful way for people to respond to the government and ruling political power. And suddenly, the city itself became their canvas. But what about Halen? Halen was once a city that, thanks to its mining industry, was known for its prosperity. And when the last coal mines closed in 1974, over 75,000 workers were facing unemployment. Around the same time period, a NATO base was opened on the ground of Staatsmine Hendricks in Brunson. Soon, Harlem became known for its addicts, homeless people, uh, vacancy and prostitutes. Not really an image to be proud of. There's only one big difference with New York. Here, it wasn't associated with hip-hop, but with the punk scene. The 80s was a time of rebellious clothing, music, art, fashion, graffiti, squatters, and heavily drug use. And as this news article paper shows us, graffiti was far from popular. Around the same time period in the US, graffiti was booming business. People from outside the subculture started to recognize the artistic potential of this art form. One of the biggest artists in our recent history, Jean-Michel Basquiat, got his first public showing. People were willing to pay a lot of money for the artworks. The art from the street was brought into the art world, and that changed the value immensely. Of course, uh, a lot of art institutes started to recognize the artistic potential as well, and started to promote it. Because of this, street artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring started to continue uh, to develop their work and started experimenting. It took quite a number of years before this art form was fully accepted in Haarlem. But now the majority of Haarlem residents are extremely proud of it. I'm one of them too, of course. Um, it's uh, quite a regular occasion nowadays that people are referring to Haarlem as street art capital of the Netherlands. And this might even be true. While our city was an early adopter, actively embracing this art form from around 2008, and with free and curated art like this XXL mural you see behind me, you get the chance to look over the shoulder of an artist. In fact, you are literally standing in their studio watching how an artwork is being created. An important factor in the development of the street art scene in Haarlem has been several foundations that each represent their own unique voice. Their focused efforts have resulted in more ambitious and long-term projects. It's also resulting in, an, uh, in working with larger organizations on equal footing. It's not that strange that a lot of people are coming to Haarlem for this beautiful artwork from Aris and, for example, Hayuro.
There's also auxiliary programming, such as exhibitions, film screenings, lectures, and a lot of neighborhood participation. Our foundation is takes also part in this movement uh, by promoting the street art scene. We are giving guided street art tours and have published several street art guides. For a few years now, entrepreneurs have also embraced this urban image of Heerlen. For example, a Michelin star restaurant have had um, both the inside and the outside of the restaurant completely painted. This bed and breakfast has given artists free reign in the various bedrooms. The city itself has fully embraced this urban image and doing everything they can to maintain this. The municipality is also providing artists a free space to work on, but at the same time, it's also giving them the opportunity to, re to reconsider their identity. It sounds all like great news, right? But there's also time for worry. Aren't we picking the puppy after all? Aren't we doing what we all hate to see? Art collectors nowadays do everything they can to uh, uh, take the most popular artworks off the street and um, sell them for a record amount. For example, with Banksy's bizarre situations and rise, in which people are uh, removing entire facets of houses uh, to sell the wall with the artwork on it for record amount. Banksy's response is famous. Um, when Banksy's favorite artwork, a famous artwork, The Girl with the Balloon, was going to be sold for $1.4 million, a built-in shredder immediately destroyed the artwork after sale. Genius, right? Another example, Museum Palazzo Popoli in Bologna, Italy, thinks that when an artwork is created without the authorization of the property owner, the artwork is illegal. So the copyright goes in favor with the property owner. He can do with the artwork whatever he likes. One property owner decided to donate a huge mural by street artist Blue to the museum. The museum used an age-old technique to remove a layer of the wall and placed it on a new surface. Of course, street artist Blue disagreed and wasn't happy with it. In response, he erased all the murals that he painted over the last 20 years in Bologna with depressing gray paint. But what about curated artworks? There are cities that are attaching information signs or are protecting the artwork with an anti-graffiti coding. It also occurs that in some cases they are trying to restore a wall and there might be several reasons for it, but the most important ones would be the court of public opinion and the relevance for the city to the promotion of a city. There are some ways you can uh, embrace temporality. For example, the build-up of layers is inherent to this art form. Just look at these walls by artists Ash and Blue. They already know that other artists are going to use this wall as well. So they better take it into advance that there is a uh, build-up of layers. Another example is that you have to promote and accept places such as the Beton Centrale in Ghent and the ghost village of Doel near Antwerp. Those places are giving the artists the freedom to create whatever they want. Empty walls, vacant lots, uh, and empty buildings are giving the artists the opportunity to create uh, everything that they like to create. And eventually, these kinds of places have become real tourist attractions as well. Another way is to document the street art scene. Let's take my favorite photographers, Martha Cooper and Henry Chaffin, as an inspiration. They already knew in 1984 that um, this art form wasn't for eternity. 
So they started to document every graffiti writer that was illegally painting in New York City. And they even published several books, for like example, subway art. I'm also documenting the street art scene for several years now. I have, um, I'm collecting stories, take pictures, give guided street art tours, and I'm also creating a yearly magazine named Anna, as you can see here. In Anna, I show the developments in a city. I make routes, but I'm also um, creating a, a small catalog. In this catalog, I'm showing the works that are visible in that year. Because I'm documenting the artworks, it is hardly to forget, uh, to forget them. It's like a little time capsule. I know, as a street art lover and a hunter, that it's really tempting to pick a puppy. It's also tempting to take artworks from the street. But we have to realize that this subculture become mainstream over time and that people are still doing it. But when we uh, don't love it to that, with too much money, rules and regulations, eventually we get to see the making process all over again, the way a work develops over time and how it slowly fades and makes way for new work. It's tempting, but if we don't love it to that, if we make sure that there is enough, enough disturbed ground, a new artwork will pop up just like a puppy. Thank you.